So uh, I want to start by explaining a little bit the name of the office. So rhizoma means rhizome. And a rhizome is basically a kind of a root. Um, and it's different from the root of a tree. So it basically is a horizontal root that grows on the ground. And it's a superficial root that rather than a deep root. So it has no hierarchy, basically. Um, and the thing about the rhizome is that it um, exchanges nutrients throughout the entire net of, um, of the root. So if you take off, it actually, so the root generates different plants. Um, and these plants are separated. They are independent from each other, although they are part of this, the same system that exchanges nutrients between the, 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 the different plants. And so if you take off one of the plants, the rhizome continues to exist, and that plant can also be planted somewhere else, and that will generate another rhizome that generates new plants. And so um, that concept in the office works as, I want to <laughs> just see what I'm talking about. Um, it works a little bit like a net um, of knowledge where we work with different partnerships and um, we develop the projects together with artists or other architects or engineers, but we, all, we, we like this idea that we have a very small structure and we can grow it as we need it and uh, add different types of um, professionals that we can exchange knowledge with. Um, so that's why we named the office Hizomo Rhizome. So since 2010, when we opened the office, well, yeah, we opened the office in 2008, but since 2010, we, we have been working with this, um, with this contemporary art museum that's called Inyo Ching, and we are now um, part of the architecture council, council of the museum, which means that we design buildings for the museum, but we also design a lot of infrastructural buildings, uh, pavilions, and we, we help make some decisions on where to locate the buildings. We have actually been asked to, to develop a master plan. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But we've been working with the museum in trying to develop um, this sort of living organism that is in your chin, that is always uh, evolving and it's always growing. And so before I start, I just want to give you a little background on contemporary art and how Inyo Ching works. Um, and so in 1964, the, this philosopher and art critic, uh, whose name is Arthur Danto, wrote a book that's called um, uh, After the End of Art. And so he actually was walking in 1964 in Chelsea around the galleries and he saw uh, the Brillo boxes from Andy Warhol and he, he actually realized years later that, that that was the moment that art really ended for him. So it's his own theory, a lot of people don't agree with, um, but he, he identified that event as being the end of the history of art. And so he wrote a, a um, a few essays that were later compiled into this book that's called After the End of Art. And although the title suggests that uh, art has died or something very tragic, that's not what he meant by the, the end of art. Um, so what he actually meant is that um, the history of art has, got, has gotten to a point where or the art has gotten to a point where you can't really defer uh, mere objects from objects of art. Um, so how do, you, how do you tell if the Brillo boxes from Andy Warhol, how are they different from just Brillo boxes that are standing in a, in a supermarket or a, in a warehouse? So the, the question of discernibility can no longer be perceived as the only way to, to understand and to, and to identify art. And so this impossibility of identifying art or differentiating art from mere or daily objects just by the way it looks or by its materiality um, 
sort of indicated that art had come to an end, that the art that we knew, the art that was, uh, um, had been developed throughout the years since the beginning of the history of art. So another um, critic whose name is Hans Belting also wrote a similar theory at around the same time. And he, he was actually arguing that if there is an era before the era of art, then we can only conclude that art is a, is a period that has a beginning and it has an end. So that by itself means that you have uh, the after the era of art. And so for him, the era of art um, means that um, in the modernism, the era of art came to a point where, until the modernism actually, um, where art is mimicking reality. And the good work of art is the, good, the, the work of art that actually mimics best the reality. And then during modernism, the, uh, this mimicking idea got replaced by a conceptual idea. So um, you st art start, started questioning itself and started going through philosophy and trying to understand what is the meaning of art. Um, and that, that he called the era of, of ideology. But then art got so abstract and so conceptual that it, it, it almost uh, lost the visual qualities that, that it had before, and then now a, just a blank canvas can be art. And so uh, at that point, uh, art actually started uh, to really uh, go in different ways. So that, that was during the 60s, and then during the 60s there were, so art was following a very linear narrative uh, since its beginning until modernism, and then during the 60s, this linear path actually started spreading around, and there were many uh, sim simultaneous uh, styles during the 60s. So there was colored, color field painting, for example, hard edged abstraction, French neo, -re neo -re realism, pop art, op art, minimalism, art de povera, conceptual art. All of this was going on during the 60s. And during the 70s, there was no style whatsoever. So, or there was no identifiable style. So art was really following this very linear path. And then it got split into sever several different um, styles. And then there was no styles. Art could be anything, really. And so now art can actually be, uh, can actually mimic reality. It can be a big installation. It can be a performance. It can be um, a painting, it can be just a photograph, pretty much anything. And that led to, a, to the crisis of the museum because how can, how can the, the solidity of, of architecture be combined with something as volatile as, as art? Something that can be anything, basically. And the museum is still telling the story as if it was a linear narrative. Um, so the museum hasn't, the architecture of the museum hasn't really understood that now you can no longer tell the story as a linear story. Um, but now you, you really cannot tell art as a narrative anymore, and art can be anything. And so we come to this idea that contemporary art is non-narrative, and that's what we think is um, the main uh, thing about in your Qing because it tells uh, it, it it actually has these pavilions that are spread throughout the landscape and it's very beautiful landscape and it has 23 pavilions that are spread in, in the land and each one tells a, a different story but there's no there's no narrative there's no way of telling the story the, the history of art in the museum but you can you can have your own experience you can go just to one single pavilion or you can go to many pavilions but make your own way or you can choose not to go in one room or the next room whereas in the museum you always have this succession of spaces where you really have to go from one room to the next to the next to the next so these are just some some of the pavilions and uh, these two pavilions were the first ones that were designed at Inyoching these are not our designs um, but they were designed f uh, with a very different intent, and it w these were very like warehouses, so they were not um, very specific 
to, um, to house the art that, that it was supposed to house. And then the, there are pavilions also that are designed by the artists themselves, which is the case for this one. Uh, it was designed by Matthew Barney. And so he designs his own pavilion. He, he, he actually puts the art inside. Or, or this one, which is um, by D Doug Aitken. And it's a hole on the ground, and it goes 200 meters deep on, on Earth. And then there's a super sensitive mic, uh, microphone at the bottom that um, amplifies the sounds of the Earth. And then there are pavilions that are dedicated to a single artist, which is the, the case of this one. Uh, this was also not designed by us, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but this is a pavilion dedicated to a Brazilian artist named, uh, named Adriana Varejão. Or this one, which um, was designed for another Brazilian artist, El Elio Sica. And then there are, of course, um, sculptures in the garden. So I'm not showing everything, but just so you understand a little bit the context in which we were working. So the first project that we were um, commissioned to design was a restaurant. And they only, hire, they only hire us when there's no money and no time. <laughs> so it's like, call the young architects. <laughs> They'll do it, you know? <laughs> and of course, we do it. Um, actually, so actually, this was like 2010, and it was a really big year for your team because in that year uh, happened a, a big opening where they opened like three or four galleries at the same time, and your team was in this transition uh, to like uh, to become a real museum. Yeah, to become like because no, this, it, it, this started as a private collection, yeah. so it was like still a, a fragile institution, and after 2010, it became like this really powerful thing and really big and they needed uh, they, they just realized like three months before that they <laughs> needed uh, a, a restaurant, restaurant for <laughs> how are people going yeah, to eat and it, this is an hour and a half away yeah. from the city so and, and before that we used to work there but we doing like really small, small stuff things. like we're doing like, like rehabilitation for bathrooms and this kitchen is not good so called the young guys and <laughs> let's do this uh, with them and this was like uh, our first opportunity the yeah this they was they the first big project yeah, that they we received us. like a call and say oh uh, we have to build a restaurant for 400 people uh, <laughs> but it have to be done in three months everything project yeah, construction, project and construction everything and it has to be super cheap and we were super excited oh my god that's our shot <laughs> and, and then we went to the site and we were there at the site and said, oh, do you have like a survey to give to us? And the owner of the museum was there and said, come on, boy, 30 steps for there, 30 steps, no, 30 20. steps in that direction, 20 steps in that direction. And then I, I go there doing the steps. Yeah, yeah, I stop there. That's it. 20 by 30. <laughs> and you put uh, a cantilever of two meters. So... <laughs> The guy already designed the project for us. <laughs> in our first big project, he designed for us. <laughs> we only put the... The, the, the breeze, the breeze Soleil, yeah. He designed. Yeah, so yeah. basically he gave us everything. With, and we actually, we actually followed his directions. We didn't want to, <laughs> to go against him. So, and this is a site that is very special because it has this work of art here, right in front of the, of the restaurant. Um, and it's a, it's a very special um, art uh, or work of art. Uh, it's very famous and it's very colorful and very big. And then we were designing this huge structure right behind it. Um, so we wanted the restaurant to kind of disappear uh, from the landscape. And actually it's, it disappears so much that it's very hard to photograph. And the photographs from a distance, the only ones that we get are at night because you can't really see it during the day. Um, and this is the, this is the work that I was talking about. And then it had these palm trees from the, from the garden and we, we realized that we had this very horizontal building, very big and very high building. 
And uh, how, how do we hide a structure like this? And when we added these vertical elements, it, it actually um, starts to, to, to mimic the, the surrounding trees. And then we, we don't really have a facade um, that, that becomes the facade. So there's a shadow behind it that actually makes the building disappear even more. And Brazil is a very hot country, and um, we always try to work with the idea of not having an air conditioning. So most of our projects, whenever possible, at Inhoching, have no doors, or I mean, they're sliding doors, but um, they, they're open all the time, and these are glass doors. So all day, this restaurant is just open, and then the breeze work independently, and if you need to protect from the sun, you can just turn it around yourself. They're very light. Um, and the plan is super simple. So we had to be smart about this. Um, no um, sophisticated materials. Uh, we know Brazilians work very well with concrete, um, and actually, you know, only uses local um, workers, so that means that they they don't know how to build, <laughs> basically, and so we we had to work with whatever they do best, and that that is concrete. They actually do know how to build, but they don't know how to read plans. So it's useless. You do like a detail, a very details yeah, and because it's useless. And so I mean, nothing. and in the end, we didn't have time to draw yeah. a lot of details. So it had to be a building with no details. Yeah, a, lo a lot of decisions were taken while the the the, the concrete slab were still with uh, supports. Yes, uh, the form support. We were like down, and no, oh, this is going to be this size and. Uh, yeah, there was yeah. no time to design, really. It was a, uh, while we were designing, they were already building. It, it was fun because the engineer who built this was also a really young guy, too. Oh, yes. And it, it was a really young uh, team. And also the, 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 the calculus engineer was a really young, too. I think he was younger than us. Yeah, and then, and so we have this, uh, we have this, um, the, 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 the slab actually has these openings that are almost like as if you were uh, lifting up a, a piece or a triangle of the, of, the, of the slab. And then it has a green roof that helps uh, keep the building cool. And these are the, the openings on the ceiling. So that, le that actually lets the, the hot air out, but it actually brings a little bit of light inside without having direct sunlight. Um, but and there's the a funny story about this. Yeah. <laughs> so because show it in. We, well, we, we, we were working with this engineer, and he was uh, young, and he was not really uh, like secure, secure about, about his work. <laughs> and, and he decided by himself to put some columns here. Yeah, and we, when we arrived to the site, the columns were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah were there. And, we, and he never even communicated that. Yeah. So we were like, what? What, <laughs> what are the, what these, these columns, columns doing columns are doing here? here? No, and he said, no, that's in the project. You designed it. Said, no, <laughs> I know it's not. I know. <laughs> and then uh, talking to the engineer who was building, he said, no, I'm going to keep this, these columns. It's in the, in the structural project, uh, so I'll keep it. And then, in Brazil, there is this figure, like, uh, you have the engineer in the, in, the, in the site, but you also have, like, the master of, well, of Master building. of construction master or something, construction. which is the main, main worker that yeah. works in the construction. But he usually, these are really uh, pretty technical guys that really know how to build. They're really good, even better than engineers. <laughs> and he called me and said, Tomas, I built this. You can take this column easily. There's so much iron <laughs> and concrete in this thing that this will never fall. And I say, so take it off. And then uh, we were afraid. Oh, my God, we're taking <laughs> off a column. Of, of without uh, the, without yeah. the, the approval of the engineer. And so. then we, ha we, we have like this, this, this artist friend, and he's, he's kind of really crazy. And, and <laughs> he's a designer, actually. And I, we told him the situation, and he, he thought, oh, I have an idea for you. <laughs> we should buy those truck uh, uh, I don't lift. know, to lift up the truck. Lift up, hey, you know, that, <laughs> to uh, change the tires, you know, when you... Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. 
jack, yeah. uh, a truck jack. But a hydraulic one. And then we paint it in, in, in like steel color and it will look like Bender from Futurama. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we can place it there and it can handle like four or five tons. <laughs> and we put it and we left a gap like, oh, let's see if this thing is going to like bend, bend or something. But it's still there, never bend it, but <laughs> yeah, there. But just in case. Yeah. And so it, it's, just a, it, it's just a roof. So th we have this idea of, of actually extending the, the exterior space into the interior. And, um, and this is such a beautiful site that you want to actually be outside, but you want to be protected from the sun. So it is just a shelter from the sun, basically. The good thing about this project, because it was all, uh, look, this is me and the other <laughs> partner. Uh, we, we had three months to do everything. So since the design uh, to build, uh, and we actually uh, participate in all the, 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 the process. Like we chose the, the, the waiter's uniform. We designed the uniform. We chose the plates. We chose the, 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 glasses. the glasses. We designed, we the, designed the, the menu. We decided the menu. <laughs> uh, so it was like so a total work yeah. of art. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, 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 we even hired like a, a hairdresser a hair. at some point to cut the hair of everybody who we worked there. <laughs> like, do whatever you want. It's a nice experience. I think this, this completes the architecture. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, and even uh, the paper, uh, the, what is it called? <laughs> to put, the, to put the, pl the plates on top. Placemats. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, so we designed everything. The name of the restaurant we gave. And so these are perforated breeze, which also allow, when, you, when the sun is out and you want to close the, the shutters, you, it, it, it actually still allows the air to go in and circulate. Ah, there's another fun story I was telling Mark. This is good for our e ego. <laughs> because uh, Norman Foster was in Iotin uh, like five years ago, five maybe, years. and we were rocking like uh, there was this crew with him, like everybody going together. Oh, Norman Foster is here, and suddenly he started to photograph this restaurant. And I was talking to his wife, and I said, "Oh, this project is fine," and she said, "Oh, you should tell him this." I said, "What? Yeah," and then I went to, to talk to him. I said, "Oh." Uh, this project is mine. And then he looked at me, uh, oh, well, uh, simple and elegant. Great start. <laughs> so, <Norman> Foster, no? <laughs> and then uh, the, same, the same year, we were commissioned to design the, the store of the museum. Um, so they have, it's actually a bo botanical garden as well, so they sell a lot of plants, and this is a botanical shop, so it sells plants and garden tools, basically. So again, we thought w we should just do a roof. Um, <laughs> and this is, uh, this is basically what it is. It, it's a very simple project, and it's a, at the entrance of the museum, so this is the reception here. And what it is is basically two walls, a pillar, and two boxes. So it, the boxes are um, deposit and administration. The walls articulate the space, and th they become these hangers for things that need to be on the wall. And this little um, pond here <laughs> that sells aquatic plants. And this is the shop when it was ready before, um, before it had the, the product inside. But it's basically, so what we did is we extended the, the exterior floor into the, the store so that it is a continuation of the garden, really. And then everything is concrete again. And th this was also, again, one project that was designed and built in three months. But the thing is that uh, your chin is really dynamic, so everything changes <laughs> really quick. So at the beginning, it was supposed to be like just this shop for selling plants and just plants and, and things that could handle be on like on the weather. In yeah, on an open environment. And suddenly they decided to sell like things Fresh. that 
that uh, needed to be protected. more protected. And then that's so why we, we add added yeah, this. So we added and now we yeah. are actually closing the entire yeah, store. So five so years like so this six years later yeah. they are closing the So now it is now it is the shop for the design stuff of the museum, notebooks, pencils, posters. Um, and there is the little pond. And it's funny because when you go there you see all of these things here, like making uh -huh. a wall. Because people fa fall like <laughs> every day. I don't know what. Into the water. Yeah. Into the water. <laughs> you have to be now dumb. And then, and then we, <laughs> we decided to put some rocks, like, to make it more, like. Yeah. And then, so they were happy with the results that we got from the two projects were the test and they finally decided to give us a pavilion <laughs> which was very exciting um, and so this this was a very specific pavilion um, it was supposed to house this one permanent installation by the artist uh, Lija Papi which is a neo concrete Brazilian artist and it's this beautiful piece with these golden strings that are attached to the ceiling and, and to the floor and it has light, lighting com coming from, from the top. And actually, so it actually invites you to circulate around it because as you circulate, the light starts revealing um, other strings that you hadn't seen before. So we, we actually started by analyzing the work and trying to understand what it was trying to ask us. Um, and we, we thought this is a very non-directional work, but we, we were given the dimensions by the curators, um, and they said, we want a building that is 21 by 21 by 6 um, meters. And, um, and, so, and it has one entrance right there, and it's always like this. They, <laughs> they almost designed the building for us. And so we, we thought, well, we have a cube with one single entrance. That, that is a very directional building. How, do we, how, how can we... Um, how can we start changing that? And then we, we made the top a little bit smaller um, and twisted it a little bit so that it gives this idea of rotation. And then we ended up with this facade that is uh, triangulated. But that not only was a strategy, a formal strategy, but it was also a, a strategy that would allow us uh, to enhance the experience in the interior of the, of the, of the gallery. So this is a view from, from the outside. No bad. And it's also nice because uh, it's a really uh, small site. And I think this, this triangle, ah, you're going to talk about this later, no? Yeah, but it's All OK. Right. <laughs> so um, it has this very strong centrality uh, where the piece is. And we wanted people to, to be able to uh, to circulate around the piece a little bit before they actually enter the room. So this is actually a very important moment where uh, the circulation is super dark and it is, it is also uh, these inclined plans. So you get very disoriented in space. And because it is super dark and the plans are sh uh, sh shifting towards you, you actually start to be afraid, and this is, this is actually the part where there's more light, but when you turn around the corner, there's no light at all. So this is where the door is, and then people can choose if they want to go left or right. Uh, usually they choose to go right, which is where this guy is standing, because it's the shortest path, and it looks a little bit more uh, lit up. And then what happens is people start to change uh, their senses. So you're coming from a very beautiful garden, very exuberant, and all these colors, very live, and you enter this very dark space. And so you start shifting your senses from, from the eyes to the, to the touch, because you, then you have to start touching the wall so you, you don't bump your head into the wall. And that, that is actually what makes the experience so amazing because you actually start to focus really on yourself and, and the space around you rather than 
uh, focusing on, uh, I don't know, your problems or your life or just uh, visual things, but you really start experiencing the space with your body. And so you, people usually enter that way and exit this way. And so again, and that gets your, eye, your eyes used to the darkness so that when you get to the room, you actually have a bigger impact from the light coming from the ceiling. And then when you exit the building, you have this also, again, a, a transition space where you have this moment so that your eyes get adjusted to the light slowly. And so, uh, like Tomás was saying, this is the site and that's the size of the building. And then there is, um, this is always a big slope. And so you actually come from this little street here and it's in the middle of the woods and all of a sudden you arrive at this building and it's a, this six meter high wall and that, that was not, um, that, that, that is kind of aggressive in a way. You arrive very suddenly to the six meter wall uh, that is super close to you. So the strategy of um, rotating the ceiling also gave, gave us this, um, a little bit of a space between you and the building when, when you arrive. And it makes the wall a little bit more three-dimensional. And then we we actually, I don't know if there, yeah, we 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 said uh, to to the landscape designer, we don't want we don't want any palm trees here. <laughs> and we arrived the next day. Literally, it was the next day. There were 40 palm trees. We counted. <laughs> And we're like, okay. <laughs> and then he planted this, um, this yeah. ivy growing on the building. And the landscape and was uh, <laughs> not designed by, uh, by us. Uh, actually, there was a whole different idea of being a much more simple, just grass. Not even the, the, those stones were supposed to be there. Yeah, it was supposed uh, to be like a, a more straight path. Yeah. And yeah, but we <laughs> everything happened so yeah. quickly that we have to adjust to the situation. With the ivy, we actually asked them to take it away because it was ruining the, the concrete and it, was, it, it grew so fast that it was also, um, it would hide the shape of the building at one point. And it was this very full ivy, it was not the ones that grow very close to the building. And then uh, in 2012 maybe, we were uh, commissioned to design another pavilion and this was a very different story. So for this one, the artist was actually alive. The, uh, the other artist was dead already, so we didn't have any interaction, and all, all of the uh, project was developed with the curators. And with this one, the artist was alive, and he is a very important figure for the, muse for the museum because he was actually a, a personal friend of the owner, and he, he was the person who told him to, to start collecting um, contemporary art because he, was, he had a collection of modern art art. Um, and so his f the first works that were acquired by the museum were from this artist. So this was supposed to be a pavilion where he would um, show his work in a very free way. So he would have permanent installations, but he would also have um, temporary installations. And uh, this needed to be a very flexible space. So. We, we started... And uh, the, 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 fun, the fun thing, the, the, the good thing is because this artist uh, was also uh, an architect, an architect uh, at some point. Mm -hmm. Well, he graduated as an architect, but he never yeah, really in, worked in, 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 in this really specific uh, school in Chile. Uh -huh. uh, so he, he, know, he, 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 kn he knew, knew what, he wanted. what he wanted since the beginning. Yeah. So we started by, by trying to understand how we can make a very flexible space without falling into the trap of having a, the white cube. And so we, we went back to looking at um, art in general and uh, we were looking at uh, how art has evolved through history. And in classicism, you can, um, you can have the, well, I mean, you can, you can describe classicism as a, as a period where th there were a lot of paintings being produced. And uh, with the painting, the relationship between the body and the painting itself is always this frontal uh, relationship 
Whereas in modernism, we, there was uh, a lot of sculptures, but still it's very external, the, the relationship. And it, it's always about uh, you being uh, distant from the object and you can circulate around it, but you, you're, not, you're not participating. Whereas in contemporan contemporaneity, <laughs> you're in between. The installations are something that allow you to participate and to be part, part of it. So you're actually in between. And so we, go, we went back to the idea of the rhizome uh, to try to understand how, how to circulate and how to, how to access these spaces. And we, we didn't want uh, to have a, a root kind of, um, kind of building where you have a very clear hierarchy. You have one axis, and from that axis you have circulation, and then you get to the, to the art itself. But we wanted everything to be mixed together. So you have many axes, and then you have many types of circulation. And the circulation works as space for exhibition as well, but you also have like spaces that are just for, for exhibition, and everything is kind of with no hierarchy, and you, you can actually make your own experience. So this is just a photo that shows the pavilion when it was ready, and uh, this is an installation that goes up the stairs. Uh, so just showing that he actually used the building as we as we proposed that really that the there is no circulation or access or and then the building is all glass and you can actually access from many many different points and this idea again that brazil is so hot uh, you want to have a roof that's hanging uh, so that you protect it from the sun but you also want to to have a big permeable space that you can extend the, the interior into the exterior and vice versa. So the fact that the building opens everywhere uh, except for the stairs means that the building is very permeable. And so the, even the architectural elements, they extend from the interior to the exterior, reinforcing this idea that there's no boundaries between interior and, and exterior. And so going back to uh, how you circulate through space, when you have the, the, the white cube, um, you have a gallery that is enclosed and um, it's facing towards itself. Um, and then you have one entrance to the room and you, you, it almost force, forces you to circulate in a very specific way. Whereas when you have um, a gallery that, that is open to the context, you, you have many different ways to circulate and you can choose your own experience. And so we were given a site and the site had a slope. Um, and so we, we split the floor into two different um, floors or levels uh, and we lifted them up from the ground so that um, you would still have the garden under the building and you would still have the permeable soil uh, under the building. And then we created two other levels and we connected those by ramps and stairs also. So it's really this idea that the, the, the ground uh, or the, the floor becomes this almost like a topological um, uh, continuous space that starts to mor morph itself and connect, uh, connects the different levels. And the plan is very simple. So the space in the end is very flexible, but we also have... Go, ba go back, please. The, uh, we are always fighting with engineers. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> but we have like w w this, this terrain with this like beautiful uh, slope. Natural slope. Natural slope. <laughs> and we were there. We, we, we marked every tree that we want to, to remain, you know, because th there, were th there was two sites in a small forest in the middle of them. So we marked everything that we want to stay, and the slope was perfect. Uh, when, you, when we go back there, all the trees that we marked was, uh, was were gone. Were gone. <laughs> and the guy got a... Uh, he, he got a, a tractor. A tractor? Uh, no, what is it? A caterpillar. What is a it your sound like? And, <laughs> and made the yeah. terrain flat. <laughs> And the project was already done. Like <laughs> the, 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 the pieces, the, the, and the structure pieces was were already there. there. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it was metallic and structure. I, oh my God! What did you do? And then after the building was done, we have to like put the land again. Yeah. And actually, so we we lifted up the building so that we would have 
the least impact possible in the in the and we we actually designed this with um, with steel structure so that there, there wouldn't be a need to be to have a huge construction site but they would just arrive with the truck and the structure and put it together assem assemble it on place but it didn't happen that way. So uh, this is one of the ramps that uh, gets you to the to all the levels. And this is just um, a view from the ramp to the to the space. So I mean, in the, in the end, he was he the artist. You should say that this is his living retrospective gallery. But um, he didn't want he didn't want it to read as a as a linear thing again as a as a narrative. So he wanted the work to mix together with the other work. So that there is no division between rooms or anything like a regular gallery. But all of the work is shown together as if it, it's really like this is uh, this is my living thing, you know, the, and then he would change with time, he would add other installations. It, it, it was designed to, to, to keep like six or seven uh, pieces of art, but in the end I think there is like 20 because he decided to keep putting things and mm -hmm. use the, 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 the ramp? No. The what? <laughs> ah, the, 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 the balcony the or balcony, the, yeah. the veranda. Yeah, and again, this idea that we really wanted the interior to extend to the exterior and to be used also, the exterior to be used also f as exhibition space. So um, he, he decided to put these um, hammocks yeah, outside. And then there's also ramps that connect the site to, the, to this exterior veranda. And then uh, this idea that you can actually view the installation from different points. Uh, so the, the gallery is so open and you have all these different levels and you can actually experience the installation through different points of view rather than having this very enclosed um, spaces where you only view the installation from or, or where you're told how to view the, the installation. And even from the outside, you can see it. And it, it also blends with the nature. And more now because this well, yeah, is so th this this is a forest. <laughs> so the thing is, this this was a forest. They they took everything away and then they had to replant it. Mm -hmm. So this was when it, when it was um, brand new. So the trees were still like super young and they hadn't grown. And this picture is nice because uh, <laughs> after the the gallery was done, we were talking to the artist and and then he he, he told us something that I don't know if it's good or bad. I keep thinking, like, uh, this gallery brought uh, some kind of happiness to my work that I never realized <laughs> it had. Uh, because when you see the same piece photographed in, in other spaces, like, uh, I think it was in, in, in Louvre, and in, not in, in yeah. these huge galleries. But he has a very morbid yeah, work. Yeah, really morbid, and this gallery brought this some happiness. Here. So I don't know what, what did he mean with that, but... <laughs> And then this idea that you can view the installation from many different places. It, it's not like you, there's this place where you're supposed to view the, the, the piece from. And again, when you're on the outside, uh, it actually blends even more with nature because of the reflex of the glass. So you, you start seeing the work in a different perspective. And this is a new work that we just changed this weekend. <laughs> so. This is not going to be built, um, but this is a pavilion that we designed for three different uh, pieces um, for Anish Kapoor. And so the idea is that you have these, uh, you arrive from the top of these stairs and you have these two viewing platforms where you can see the museum. And then you go down the stairs and there's this idea of a central void, which is something that Kapoor works a lot with. Um, with this ar artificial landscape that would be developed with him, and th that's just a suggestion, obviously. Um, and then the, the galleries themselves would be uh, inside these spaces under the platforms.
And it also deals with this idea that the site is a mining, um, is a mining site. And so it deals with this idea of bringing the, 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 the stones from the mining back to, to, the, to the pavilion as sort of like a memory trace of what it used to be. And then there are smaller things that we designed for Inyo Ching, and this is one that just got ready um, a month ago or so. And it's a small cafe, um, and it's right next to the botanical shop. And so we wanted to do something very simple that could be assembled in place. This is at the entrance of the museum, so we didn't want to have like a construction site again. And so it's a very simple box that is just put there and assembled in place. And it has, again, a, a protection from the sun, but it's very open and it's very small and all the seating area is outside. So this museum basically doesn't work with rain. So <laughs> we do. If, if there's rain, people don't go there. Um, or they go with caps and then they wouldn't sit here. So. And this is just showing where it's located. So the tables are now right next to the, to the botanical store. And now, outside of Inyoching, we also work with other projects. And this is another one that just got ready, so we decided to show it. It's a, it's a showroom for the light designer, Ingo Maurer. And uh, we, we, had these, we had this building that was actually an, an old house in the front and then a big warehouse in the back. Um, so we changed the facade of the old house and we built this tunnel, very compressed tunnel that takes you from the little house. So the little house has a lot of uh, structure and structural walls that we couldn't remove. So we, we, uh, we decided to keep the little house for smaller spaces, um, administration and things like that, and the showroom in the back uh, in the warehouse. But this project has a lot of fun stories because, uh, well, it was a really old house, <laughs> really old house, and there was this huge uh, barn, barn, no, uh, uh, warehouse, warehouse in, the, in the back. And this guy is Ingo Maurer, and well, he's like an 80, 85-year-old uh, guy. He's like a genius. And we were talking about the project, and he wanted to put a... Uh, a glass roof. A glass roof. Between the between house and the, the house warehouse. Between the, the old house and the, and the, the warehouse. warehouse. And we obviously told him, oh, let's cut the warehouse. It's simple, it's more simple, and uh, it's going to be cheaper, and it's... It's gonna because be really they, were, easy. they were connected yeah. together, so th you needed to make a section through one of them. Yeah, and then he decided, no, I want to cut the old house. <laughs> and I say, this house is going to fall, fall apart. <laughs> and he said, no, let's try, let's try. It's good because the... the, the, the he wanted to keep the proportions of the yeah. warehouse, which we understand also. But basically, the house... Fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun because it was like four engineers in the whole process. This was like a five-year project uh -huh. uh, between project and build. So there was several. And the and the, the, the engineer that actually got to, to uh, calculate the structure, he he designed a structure that was so heavy that it could probably have a building of twenty floors on top. Yeah. And and then the, it was all wrong. It was, the the structure was built in the wrong places, so we had to adjust everything. It was it was a painful <laughs> project, but it finally got ready uh, a month ago. Also, so you have this very compressed tunnel with also lighting um, that is also to be uh, sold, and then you get to this amazing open space where you can start to see a little bit of the, of, the, of the pieces that he has. And this is just a view from the other. I don't know why this image is so bad. It's, it, this is a view from the other side. So it shows the tunnel here. This is uh, these small little spaces in the, in the old house. And then there's a garden here on the right uh, and a staircase that takes you to, to um, second floor and also to a, a, a roof garden. And this is the, the glass that he wanted to put in the middle. 
And then we were like, this is a, a light shop. You want to put a glass ceiling, we, you're not going to be able to see the light. So in the end, we decided to put these uh, kind of shutters <laughs> in some of the panels so that the light could be a little bit more controlled. And this is the back of the warehouse, so you have these doors that open during the day and then you don't need air conditioning. This piece cost one million <laughs> a meter. This is a four meter uh, piece. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all gold and it's, yeah, it's very extravagant. And this is actually a, an egg made with eggshell. It's, it's a very beautiful piece. And so this is the staircase that leads to... I have another fun story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this it's 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 fun now, but it was tragic. <laughs> <laughs> it's tragic. Uh, we were visiting the the the, the work site, and I always like to go to the the <laughs> to the roof to see how it looks. And I asked the engineer, "Can I go on the roof?" And he said, "Yeah, go ahead." But it, it still had the no no it, they no. had just taken it, yeah, off the just the taken sports. off the the. the Oh, uh, yeah, but I'm... <laughs> and I was walking in the roof, <laughs> and I was walking, and suddenly, I felt... I f the roof the fell. The roof fell. <laughs> I, f I, f I felt from here to here, like... <laughs> like a, a whole floor. Yeah. In the end, when I was going out, the engineer said, oh, I'm going to send you the bill. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so there is this... Um, there is this little pond here also that uh, ch changes um, the experience of the staircase. So the water is always moving and there's uh, the sunlight coming from, from the, the sky and, uh, and then there's always this beautiful pa pattern on the, on the walls of the stair here. And this is the roof and it also serves as exhibition space for some exterior pieces. And this is just the exit from the stair. And they, they have the, a pet. <laughs> I forgot the name. And then that little garden area is actually a semi-enclosed or semi-covered space. So there's areas that are not covered that have garden. But in the back, there's a little kitchen where they can invite people for coffee or um, can make a cocktail or something, and this is um, an elevator that brings you to the roof top and to the second level. And this is just a an image from the big showroom. And he really wanted he really wanted this place to look like an atelier or a place with tables where people are working on the project of of the lamps and. Um, Things are really mixed together. There's no, uh, but it's, it doesn't look like a, 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 a shop where you would buy a lamp. Mm. It's almost a knock gallery now. Yeah. And then just smaller projects that we designed. This is a bathroom uh, uh, module that we designed for Inochin also. And this is a library also at Inyochin, and the, there we have a lot of unbuilt projects there because uh, the economy in Brazil, as you probably know, is not going very well, so uh, we're always trying to find sponsors for the buildings, but it's, n it's not happening at the moment. <laughs> no, it's just the fact that they have an architect so easily, they keep demanding. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's try this, let's try this. So. And this is a, a botanical lab with uh, different buildings. Each one has a different function to develop. The, so it, they, they actually create a lot of species of, of plants. And uh, there's, uh, it's actually a place that you can visit. So there's auditorium spaces. This is a music school. So they, they have a lot of social programs um, for the community around it. and. Um, they have a choir uh, for poor children 
and they, they wanted us to design a music school and we actually did two projects. Uh, like we, we keep doing <laughs> No, <laughs> because one was a uh, They changed a the a site. Chord, chord, chord school? Chord, chord school. Chord school yeah, and, and, and it was also in a different site. And the other was for choir. Yeah, so th this, this was a building that's a actually outside the museum and it's very close to this uh, very poor community. So w we wanted the architecture to be a little bit more quiet. Um, and the scale is also for kids, so we wanted the building to have a more human scale. This is a project that we designed for a guard house. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, in the early images, you showed a, a, a Malayfish white square. Oh my God! Okay, hi. Oh, <laughs> in the early image, now we're on a white square. You showed the the white square square of Malevich, and then in one of your projects, you had a rotated white square, and you talked about art. Mm -hmm. Just maybe talk about the uh, impact of conceptual art in your work or something, and. Well, uh, because in your team, it, it, we also design, we always design very specific buildings for specific artists or for a specific work of art. We always try to, to understand the, the work of art and, and we read a lot about the artist and, um, and that's why we actually end up with very different projects. Uh, you can see the first one, the first gallery is completely different. Even the, the way you experience the building, we, that one is, a, we are telling people how to how to behave, and we're we're telling them that uh, this you know we're actually creating the the experience. Whereas on the other one, it's very free, and you you can experience it any way you want. So it, it always has to do with um, with how the artist works, and um, I mean for Li for Lija Papi's um, gallery, we also studied a lot of her work, and she has a lot of geometric. Um, forms and she, she works a lot with this idea of triangles, uh, squares, and so we didn't want to actually replicate the work, but we wanted to, to make it so that it seems like it's, it's, it's actually a skin to her work. So we always try to make, to understand what the artwork is, is actually uh, suggesting. <laughs> So, I mean, we, we, uh, we study a lot of art, but uh, in the conceptual level, I think architecture is very different because architecture is about creating spaces and it's not as visual as, as the art. So uh, we always tell this to our students that we don't want you to create form, but we want you to create uh, spaces that are um, quality spaces. So. It, it does relate one to the other, but I'm not sure you can you can reduce the architecture to just uh, a simple concept or form. And in your chin, uh, the art came first. Uh, the architecture was always like a second uh, thing. It's changing now, but. The architecture at, at, at this point is just like to serve uh, the art. I think. Yeah, and uh, there, there was a turning point. So that they built yeah. like six or seven pavilions with this architect that was just designing uh, warehouses, basically. And then there was this turning point with Adriana Varejan pavilion that I showed in the beginning of the lecture. Uh, this very beautiful concrete box um, that sort of fluctuates uh, above these, uh, this lake. Um, and that, that was the turning point because Adriana was very specific. She said, I, I want my own architect and I want to work with him in the process. And it, it was a long process. They were designing the building together. And so that became a norm after that, that the architects actually work with the, with the artists or with the curators. Any other questions? <laughs> Can you, I have a question, can you speak a little bit about the relationship you have with the client? I think you, you already talked a lot about uh -huh. this, but there is like this wrong conception that 
an architect has the best position if he's completely free. But it's actually, I think that's actually wrong because we always react to something if it's site, program. And working with the client is, is essentially very different from what you guys do. I mean, we as, as educators, we play the role of the client, kind mm -hmm. of. But we, we also put different hats on depending on what stage your design is. So can you speak a little bit about the experience to work with the client and how, mm -hmm. that, how that works for you and how it influences the work? I think, first of all, as young architects, they always hire us thinking these people are going to be cheap <laughs> and they're going to do what I want. Um, so there's always this idea that uh, we have to do things very quickly and very cheap. Um, and we actually try to work with those constraints because uh, th that actually made us very quick. And we, we now make projects like <laughs> super quickly. Um, and, and that was good for us. And it actually changed a lot of our work. So the simplicity is there because it has to be there. Uh, it, there is no money. There is no time. Uh, the, there is no educated workers working on the site. So you, 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 it actually starts shaping your, your design, really. And the client is always this figure that... Uh, and especially in this case, we, we have curators, we have artists, and those are our clients also. Um, and they have very specific needs that they, that they, they tell us, and we, we have to respond to those needs. So, for example, for the, the Kapoor Pavilion, we, we went for a meeting with him in London, and when we arrived, he had a model of the project. It was ready. <laughs> And we said, okay, well, well, let's see what he has to say about it. And he, he showed us the project, and we were not sure about it. So we made a version of what he wanted, and then we, we changed, uh, and we made our own version, and we submitted our own version. That and requires courage. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. And so th there's always th this game that you have to play also. You have to respond to their desires, but you also have to, you, you know better than they know about architecture. Well, I, at least you, you should. <laughs> so um, there's always this, this trying to negotiate between what you think is best and what they think is best. But I think we always take risks too. Uh, we I think we always choose, like, let's do, uh, the client asks for something, but we are not sure about the, 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 the about his choices. Uh, we always present something that we think it's better for him. <laughs> and most of the time, like 90%, it worked. Mm -hmm. So... But it, but it, it's a complicated relationship, yeah. and it, it's uh, you have to be a little bit of a psychologist as yeah. well, <laughs> trying to understand what they want, but also trying to sneak <laughs> a little bit of your own desires. And at the same time, these are really, uh, really well-known people, really uh, great artists, great designers. They're really important people, and that is. Let, let the ego with them, so let's just do our And the work. other thing is they, they, ha they, they know what a, a space for their own work should be like, maybe better than we do. So we also learn a lot from them, and um, it's, it's this exchange, it's the idea of the rhizome. We're actually using our clients al also as, as partners to exchange knowledge. <laughs> well, just to kind of follow up with his question, um, the lamp shop that you guys designed, the old man wanted the glass ceiling in between. Um, can you speak a little bit on like the design method you guys chose in which you guys placed to block those panels to block out the light, um, how they were arranged on the ceiling? Or was it just kind of a it was, it, th That was a purely compositional <laughs> work. Because uh, under the, 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 that glass ceiling, it was just these three lamps, um, these three big lamps, actually. So it, it was, uh, there was nothing to hide or to... It, it was really just trying to control the light a little bit more. But it's removable. Oh, it, okay. 
and how did he feel about the panels? He liked it actually. Yeah. He will, yeah. He was, yeah, he was there for the opening a month ago, and he was very happy with the result. But it was a, it was a, a long and painful process. <laughs> yeah, because the client... Uh, this, this building took like five years to, to get done. So it, it was almost done, and then the money uh, was over, and like one year closed so everything was broke and again people go get in and break things and th that glass is a huge glass it's like a seven meters by three it's a, a one only piece and it was broke twice the glass uh, from the pond yeah. from the water yeah and it's it, it was a really hard pro process so i think in the end everybody was so happy <laughs> that oh just if, if you want to put this, put this. Don't. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you. you for. Thank you. I'm sorry about the English and uh, sorry about the. Uh, you know, but all right. <laughs>